My name is Julie Q, um, and I spend a lot of time working with databases. Most of you are pro have probably run across the issue that I'm going to talk about today, which is that at some point, all of us need to edit data in production. There's a lot of ways in which we can go about doing this, some of which are better than others. And today, I'm here to share with you some of the strategies for editing that I've helped develop at my company. Hopefully, the strategies that I'm about to share will make editing production database da data at your organization safer as well. So a little bit about me. I'm an engineering lead at Spring. For those of you who haven't heard of Spring before, Spring is a fashion e-commerce marketplace that integrates with thousands of different brands. At Spring, I lead the catalog platform team, which is that's one of the engineering teams that builds out our product catalog. This means that I spend a lot of time thinking about things like how data can get ingested into our system. And over the past few years, more often than I would like, I found myself behind the SQL prompt needing to make edits to production data. And after being in this situation a couple of times, I started to ask myself why. We all know that editing data directly, directly in production is really bad practice. So why do we all do it anyways? For me, the first reason is often because the internal tools that I need to edit this data is just not available. I would use a better method, but it doesn't exist. The second is that edge cases exist. So sometimes we actually do take the time to build out that perfect user interface. But then we'll run into an edge case and find ourselves behind the SQL prompt again. And lastly, sometimes we have to make time-sensitive changes. And a lot of times, getting behind the SQL prompt and making these uh, edits on production directly is just the fastest and easiest solution. And usually, if we think about it, there isn't that much of a problem with it either. So for example, let's say um, I want to update our products table. And I want to rename the name of the first product to Julie's product. So I would write a SQL query like this. And before running it, I would usually have a coworker look over my shoulder and spot check me. But let's just say that this one time, it's Friday night. And someone on the marketing team has come up to me, and they're like, Julie, I need you to make this change. We promised the brand that we do it before this weekend. If you don't do it, they're going to pull themselves off our platform. And so you know, I go to my desk, I write the SQL query, and then when I'm done writing, I look around and I realize all the other engineers have already left. After all, it is Friday night. And at this point, I'm thinking, well, I could just send a message to someone over Slack or our, our chat channel and have them double check my query. But at the same time, I don't really want to bother anyone. And I'm thinking, I've done this a million times before. This is a really simple query, as we can all see. So what is the worst thing that's going to happen? <laughs> so I go ahead. Uh, I'm going to run this query. I send the Slack to the marketing team, and I tell them I'm done. I go get some water before um, I head home for the weekend, come back, look at my laptop. This is the query that I actually ran. <laughs> and for those of you who aren't familiar with SQL, the rest of the audience is laughing because they know that I just accidentally updated every single product in our database to be named Julie's product. <laughs> so I'm sure some of us are laughing because uh, we actually have disaster stories similar to what I just described. And the key here is that these mistakes, they don't happen because we're bad at our jobs or we're bad engineers. They happen because mistakes happen. And having the ability to make any edit you want on a production database really sets you up to make this kind of mistake. So today, I want to talk you through some strategies to edit data in production that's going to make it safer at your organization. Today, we're going to talk through five strategies. These include strategies for maintaining a raw SQL spreadsheet, running scripts locally, running scripts on an existing server, 
using a task runner and building out a script runner service. We're gonna walk through each of these strategies in order of the amount of upfront investment that is necessary um, and the benefits that you'll receive. We'll also plot them so that you can see what it look, they look like against each other. And for each strategy, we're gonna talk about three things. We'll talk about how this strategy works and an example of how to implement it, what's great about the strategy, and also what's not so great. In the examples that I'll use, I'll be talking about a Python stack and a SQL database, but these strategies work with any stack of your choice. So let's get started. The first strategy we're gonna talk about is pretty simple. It doesn't require any new code to be written or any infrastructure to be built. Rather, it's simply developing a process for what we all know we should be doing already. So what does this process look like? Let's go back to this query that I had intended to run for the marketing team. So what I really wanted to do was I wanted to update the name of the first product to Julie's product. And what I did a few slides ago was I just went ahead and I edited that field without any supervision at all. As we can all tell, that was a pretty bad situation to be in. So what we did at my company is we actually started maintaining a Google spreadsheet to record manual SQL queries against production. This Google spreadsheet allowed us to collaborate and review each other's queries before we execute them. It also gives us a checklist for what we should be doing before we run a query against production. So here's what this checklist looks like. The first step is for me to add a record to a spreadsheet. Some information that I would include in this record include things like my name, the date, a description of the query and why I'm running it, and the query itself. I'd also write down things like who I want to review this query, and then that person will look at my query and either approve it or request changes. So in this case, my coworker, Opportunity noticed, I spelled Julie wrong, made that comment, and I'll go ahead and make that change. The next step is for the reviewer to go ahead and approve the query. And so then, once you've gotten those two thumbs up, you can go ahead and run the query. In this step, we ask everyone to run their manual edits inside a transaction. That way, if they notice that they made a mistake halfway through, it's really easy to just roll back. So what's great about this uh, strategy? The first is that it's really easy to implement. You can actually just get this process started during the coffee break today. All it really takes is for you to make a spreadsheet and send it out and an email to your team. But the effects of the strategy can be really powerful. And that's because it gives you an audit trail. So after we implemented this process, we went from having all these ad hoc queries that we were hoping people were getting checked, um, and we found out that we actually ended up having a log of everything that was being run against production. And in this log, not only did we have the actual queries being ran, but we had information like who was running it, why they were running this query, how often they were running this query, and it let, prompted a lot of discussions for us internally. It made us talk about things like, maybe we should really be investing in internal tools, or does the system really make sense if we're making edits to it multiple times a day? Should we just overhaul and rebuild it entirely? And lastly, having this checklist promotes the right behaviors. Because if you've worked with databases for a while, there might be a lot of things that seem like common sense. Of course you should run your uh, edits inside a transaction. But not everyone who needs to edit data in production knows this. Certainly when I was a junior engineer, I wasn't sure about this when I was on call. So having this process in place helps to not only encourage people to be more careful, but it also actually teaches them what are the right things to do. And if we take a step back in this presentation, we're gonna go on a journey to explore each of these strategies in terms of their benefits and their upfront effort. So on the x-axis, we're gonna plot the benefits we get from each strategy, and on the y-axis, we'll plot these strategies in terms of the amount of effort that we need in order to get this implemented at your organization. So right now we're here, we have a strategy that gives us the benefit of data editing it requires very little upfront investment. We have also implemented a manual version of a code review process and an audit trail. This is great because at your average startup, raw SQL edits are probably not gonna go away. We still use this spreadsheet to this day. 
But this process makes it a lot easier because now we're empowering people to avoid making mistakes that would have been really easy to make in the first place. Introducing this process also makes it just a little bit more painful for people to run the queries that they need. So that way they're encouraged to build things that make their processes better. So what are some things that are not great with this strategy? Well, the first is that it's still kind of easy to make mistakes. Because after all, we're assuming that people are copy and pasting the queries, they're putting in the spreadsheet, entering it directly in their SQL prompt, but that might not be true. And even so, if we're copy and pasting from one place to another, that can obviously lead to mistakes. The second thing is that the audit trail that we're maintaining here, it's at will. There's nothing that's really forcing someone to use it. Um, at, and sometimes if we are in, say, like an urgent situation, um, in an unexpected situation, we might sometimes just go ahead and skip this step. So let's say I'm on call, I get a phone call at three in the morning, and I find out that our website is down, and the way to fix it is to run and edit in production. At this time, I might be really pressed to get this fix out, and so I might not want to get my uh, query approved because it's in the middle of the night. But did I also mention that it's 3 a.m.? That's probably when I'm most likely to make that really simple but horrible mistake, like dropping a wear clause. And lastly, while it's kind of easy to update the name of one product, it can be really difficult to execute long and complex logic if we only have raw SQL. So if your query takes a long time to run, it might time out. And if we're going back to this query that we've been trying to run and we want to run some variations of it, some of those might be a little bit more complex. For example, what if the marketing team didn't give me a product ID? What if instead they said to me, hey, Julie, we want you to update the name of every single product uh, in the brand Julie's store that is currently active and doesn't have a name and rename that to Julie's product. So we can see how the logic can get complex really quickly and we want a better system for handling this than just raw SQL. So let's talk about our next strategy, which is going to help us run these long and complex queries. Our next strategy is to write scripts and run them locally on our machines. So here's what this process looks like. To run scripts locally, we first start by writing the script. Hmm. Okay, well, <laughs> you write the script by um, taking the raw SQL, converting it in with your ORM of choice. So in my case, it's Python. Um, and so we take that raw SQL logic and convert it to code. Once we have the script, the next step is we're going to want to form a connection to the production database. So we can do this either using a VPN or an SSH gateway. And then lastly, we're just going to run the script from our terminal. So in Python, this is what this command would look like. I often like to write my scripts in such a way that I can add a dry run flag. So that way I can preview the results before I actually make the changes to production. So what do we like about this strategy? Well, the first is that scripts, unlike raw SQL, are reusable. So I only have to write my script once, and I can pass in different arguments. Second. If you need to manipulate the outputs of the script, it's really easy to then just pipe it into a text file or pipe into a new script that you might want to run. And lastly, running a script actually gives you access to all of the code on your local laptop. So it's really easy to do things like import functions from common code and reuse logic that you might have already written before. 
So looking at our journey, we now have a strategy that gives us two benefits. We can make the edits, uh, we can edit data directly, but we're also able to edit database edits that have somewhat complex logic. At this point, we don't need to set up any infrastructure, so the upfront investment is still relatively low, but it's a little bit higher than just running queries with raw SQL. But why don't we get with this process yet? Well, the first is that code review isn't being strictly enforced here. So someone can write and run a script without any form of code review right from their laptop. Second, the outputs of the script are only available on the user's machine. So if a mistake happens, we're only able to see logs they're only able to see logs locally on their laptop. And lastly, we can run into things like network connectivity issues. The script will stop running, say, if the internet dies out or if the user closes their computer by accident. Which kind of begs the question, what are we supposed to do if our scripts take a really long time to run? For example, what if I wanted to run this query many times? In fact, at Spring, we currently have over 50 million products in our database. So what if I wanted to update a field on them 50 million times? This is actually a common situation that I sometimes run into on projects. I've often had to do data migrations on the entire products table. And when I first started working at Spring, I often just found myself coming into work really, really early so that I can leave my laptop open for the entire day. <laughs> and this was until one day I was sitting there waiting all day, and by the end of the day, only 25% of the products had been processed. So I talked to my manager at the time about workaround strategies, and we sat there thinking, wouldn't it be nice if I had a computer that was configured with all the information I needed, had all the code I needed, but unlike my laptop, this computer was just on all the time. Well, conveniently, we have several EC2 instances set up in AWS just to do that. After all, that is how our website stays up and running all the time. So the next strategy we're gonna talk about is how to run scripts on an existing server. Here's how this looks. So similar to the last strategy, we're gonna start by running, writing a script. Because we're running the script on a server, the second step now is we have to get the script onto the server. And there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. You could deploy the code onto a remote re repository like GitHub and fetch a copy of it onto the server. You could upload it or you could transfer it. We compile code before we deploy our applications. So what I usually do is I would merge into a repository and then SCP the script onto the remote server. I use Jenkins um, as the server for which to run my scripts on because that's the continuous integration server that we use for deployments. And then after the code exists on the server, the last step is to SSH in and then run the script inside a session. I'm a big fan of using Screen. Other people like to use Tmux as their terminal multiplexer. In general, this method of running scripts on Jenkins has worked really well, and it's got me through some really major projects. This was really all until one day, uh, I happened to see this in our company chat channel. Our on-call engineer, Maya, happened to notice that she couldn't SSH into Jenkins, and so she pinged our DevOps lead, Justin, and said, hey, it's down. And I'm a really responsible engineer. So obviously, this is what I do next. I confirm, and I'm like, hey, Justin, it is down. <laughs> and so after doing my responsibility as being a good engineer, I go back to work, and then two minutes later, I had a realization. I think I shut down Jenkins. <laughs> and my hunch was right. Uh, it turns out that Jenkins was down because the script that I was running on it was using up all the CPU, and as a result, none of our engineers could deploy any code for, to production. <laughs> it was a really easy fix, though. All Maya had to do was reboot the instance to bring Jenkins back up, which means that running code on an existing uh, server is still a really good strategy for running long scripts, especially if you monitor it a little bit closely, um, a little bit better than I did, and also a little bit of downtime on the server isn't the worst thing. 
But it was definitely a lesson learned for me personally to look into putting in better tools for our organization. So before we talk about improvements, let's talk about what's good about this strategy. Well, the first is we've gotten a new feature now. We can run really long scripts, and we don't need to worry about things like making sure our computer is on or our battery doesn't die. You can run your scripts inside a session, come back, and just check it to see if it's done later. Similarly, because we're running scripts on a remote server, we have the benefit of a much more reliable network connection. So we don't have to worry about things like, oh no, the Wi-Fi got disconnected, and I don't know where I left off in my script. And lastly, you're getting all the benefits of running scripts on a server, and we haven't had to set up any new infrastructure or spin up any new servers. So when we take a look at this strategy in comparison to raw SQL and running local scripts, the main benefit we see now is that we can run scripts for a really long time, and we don't have to worry about our laptop shutting off. This strategy also has relatively low investment costs. So yeah, there's some DevOps configuration involved, which makes the investment a little bit higher than running just run, running law, local scripts purely. Um, but it's still a relatively easy system to set up. What doesn't this strategy get us, though? Well, as we saw in my case, uh, running scripts can really affect the resources that are available on that server. So in my case, we used up way too much CPU. In other cases, you might use up way too much memory, and you can trigger the infamous oom um killer to kick in. This process, as you might have been able to see, it's not the most user friendly. I have to copy my scripts onto a remote server. I have to SSH into that server. I have to make sure my sessions are running. It's, we can definitely come up with a better user friendly experience. And this op also opens up a lot of room for error. And lastly, we still don't have a persistent audit trail. Sure, there's logs available on the server, but they're probably going to get lost as soon as that session ends. And it's also probably the only the engineer who's running the script who can actually see these logs. So we can do better. Let's talk about a strategy that is more user friendly for our engineers and also gives us a persistent audit trail. So the next strategy we're going to talk about is using a task runner. A task runner lets us automate the tasks that are involved in running a script. So this includes all the things that we just had to do manually, like SSH into the server, set up a virtual environment in the case of Python, get a copy of the code. All the repetitive things we had to do when we were using an existing server, we can just automate them with a task runner. And the best part is that we can also get logging to be built in. So we set up a task runner at my company on Jenkins because we use Jenkins as our continuous integration server for builds and deployments. Jenkins also lets you write code and register some arbitrary jobs. And the Jenkins build page gave us a free UI to run all of these scripts from. Similar to the last strategy, the first step here is to write the script. Now we're going to get the script code review, tested, and merged into our repository. And then lastly, instead of SSHing into the server to run the script, we're instead just going to run the script using the Jenkins UI. So for us, this is what our user interface looks like. To run the script, you would go to the project, type in the file path of the script you want to run, select the arguments you want to use, and then click Build. Jenkins will then take care of setting up a virtual environment, connecting to a remote database, and running the script with the arguments that you input it. And you can kind of just sit there and watch it happen and come back to it whenever. So what's really great about this strategy is it's the first one we've discussed today that's gotten us persistent audit logs. This, these logs make it easier not just to monitor the progress of your script as it's happening, but it also lets you be able to go back and track down anything that has happened. Because the first step of our task runner is to fetch a, the latest copy of master, all code being run on the task runner now needs to be code reviewed um, and merged into the repository. So this means that we can enforce code review on the scripts that are being run, and we've also provided the ability to run automated tests. And lastly, we can now run our scripts from a user interface, which is a lot nicer than having to SSH into a server and make sure our sessions are up and running. 
And we've come pretty far on our journey now. So at this point, we have a process for code review for running automated tests and audit trail in the user interface. Setting up a task runner does take a little bit of time, but when I think about the amount of time that our team of 50 engineers has been able to save because we don't need to do cumbersome things like SCP code onto a remote server or figure out how to correct mistakes when we have no logs to be able to trace down those mistakes with, the upfront investment seems pretty worth it. There are some reasons, though, that this task runner is still not exactly what we want. And for us, the main thing is that having a task runner makes it kind of hard to manage credentials in a centralized location. So as we saw from the UI, we had to input command line arguments every time we wanted to run a script. And this can get really annoying. It also makes it particularly hard to manage credentials in a centralized location. And this is particularly annoying if you have a lot of credentials you need to manage. For us, this was the main driver for looking into better solutions. So after our task runner launched, I found out that one of our engineers was still running long scripts by copying them onto an existing server. And this was simply because his scripts had over 30 credentials, so it was a lot easier just to store them all as a text file on the server as opposed to inputting them in every single time. The second is that this task runner doesn't provide a clear separation of environment. So it's pretty easy for me to be specifying that I want to run something on the production database and then accidentally putting in credentials from dev instead. And lastly, there's no system in place here for us to verify the arguments that we're passing in. So for example, if I write a script to update the name of a product, who's there to make sure that I'm updating product one instead of product two, or spelling Julie correctly when I'm updating the name? And all of these real annoying problems, they got me thinking. <laughs> we have all these problems we're dealing with, uh, configuration management, logging, separating environments. Haven't we solved all of these problems before? After all, all of our existing applications do this. Our web server outputs logs, our Python applications, they all share the same credentials. So why have I been trying to reinvent the wheel instead of just using the tools that we already have? And so that was what I did with our next strategy. I used the tools that we use to build our applications to build out a fully fledged script runner service. And this was architected like the rest of our Python applications. Here's what the architecture for my script runner service looked like. So an application server was set up for each environment to run scripts. Each server then had access to the credentials that we would store and puppet with Hiera. Uh, these, are, these credentials are common to all of our EC2 instances in those environments. The application was set up to connect to the database in its respective environment. And then the steps for running the script were really similar, actually, to those for using a task runner. So first, the user is going to write the script. They're going to get it code reviewed, tested, and merged. And lastly, the key difference between this strategy and the task runner strategy is that instead of having to input a long series of command line arguments, all you need to do now is just pick the environment you want to run the script in, and all the credentials will already be there. So this is how it looks to run a script with this UI. The user would go to the user interface. They would type in the file path of the script they want to run, pick the environment, and then just click Build. So all the command line arguments that we had to manually enter before, they're now available as environment variables on the script on our server. Which brings us to some of the key benefits of the script runner service. The first of which being centralized configuration management. So we now have a system for using credentials in our script that is much more organized than just selecting a bunch of command line arguments. We also now have a clear separation for environments. And lastly, this system is by far the most user friendly of all the strategies that we've seen. And the amazing thing about the script runner service is that because it's an application, it doesn't stop there. There's even more that we can do. So for example, if 50 engineers all needed to run scripts at the same time, we can parallelize and scale our instances to make that possible. 
If we wanted to see what happens before the script actually commits changes to the database, we could build in functionality like a preview mode. So this would prompt me to realize something like I spelled something wrong or I'm updating the wrong product. And in the end, it's really up to you to customize your own version of Script Runner. So we've seen today a spectrum of tools that we could be using for editing production data. So some of you might now be wondering, which strategy do I use? Well, ultimately, that actually depends on the needs of your team and your willingness to invest in the upfront cost of building the tool. So if you, for your team, if your team is really small, speed is really important, something like editing a raw SQL and running local scripts from the command line might be the best strategy. But for larger teams, benefits like logging and auditing can be really important. You can't have 60 engineers sitting there editing from a Google Doc every single time they need to make any edit to production. And you might also need a way to manage configurations in a centralized way that you might not need when your team is smaller. So in that case, building out a script runner service might make sense for your needs. But the key here is that as you think about growing your business and growing your engineering team, make sure that you're also putting in the time to think about upgrading the infrastructure and internal tools that they need to be supported. Which kind of brings me to a key learning that I had in the process of building out these tools for running scripts. Which is that when you're building tools for your team, it's important to not just think about safety, but also think about speed and usability. Because after all, that is why people are getting behind the SQL prompt in the first place. In the same way that it's important to think about the end user when we're building out our consumer applications, it's also important to think about building out things that are usable for your engineers. Because after all, engineers are also people. <laughs> and on the flip side, a lot of times we find ourselves doing things that we know we shouldn't. We are all doing something, looking at it, and thinking, hmm, this is really not ideal. Or, I really shouldn't do this. And then after we go up and get a drink of water, two seconds later, we're doing it anyways. So you should really think about investing uh, the effort to stop doing that early on. Ideally, before you change the name of 50 million products to Julie's product. <laughs> um, thank you all for listening. <laughs>